Today, my guest is George, who runs the blog at The Tin Men. He is a passionate blogger and advocate for men's mental health. He often has the overlooked conversations surrounding masculinity, engaging in candid discussions about the challenges that men face today. And it's exactly what we do today, with a literally alarming statistics on male suicide on the rise and the stigma around men's mental health being as it is, we emphasize the need for open dialogue and we have exactly just that. I can imagine today's topics are quite sensitive to either those who have faced some of the struggles mentioned today or people that might have had someone in their life that has. I encourage you today to listen to this episode and share it with someone that might need it. I really hope this moves the dial on the stigma around men's mental health and helps those who need help most. I really thank George for coming on and having this candid conversation today because it wasn't easy. I have faced some of the symptoms that we spoke about today and I have had people in my family, which you'll hear, take their lives from suicide. Uh, I hope to raise awareness of this cause and I, again, I thank George for coming on to be so candid. I hope you enjoy this episode and please share it with someone that might need it. But now... George at the Tin Men. This episode is brought to you by Man Alive by Mantra Men's Work. It's the ultimate four-month coaching program for men who are ready to heal, then grow, then transform every area of their lives. Combining two life-changing retreats with 15 weeks of expert group and one-to-one coaching, this program will help you improve your mental health, emotional intelligence and resilience while unlocking your true potential as a man. Whether you're looking to elevate your leadership skills, let go of limiting beliefs, or build towards a more fulfilling life, Man Alive provides the tools, community, and support to make real lasting change. And you heard all about that in this episode. This is your chance to step up, take control, and create the life you've always wanted and those around want you to have. Don't wait. To find out more and book your spot today, reach out to Man Alive at Mantra Men's Work. Their expert coaches will guide you through a carefully crafted curriculum that addresses the unique challenges that men face in today's world, which we've explored. From developing emotional resilience to honing leadership skills, every aspect of the program is designed to help you become the best version of yourself. Join Man Alive to start your journey to a more fulfilled, purposeful life. All the links and information is in the bio. Contact David Miller at Mantra Men's Work. This episode is brought to you by my friends at Finiston Clothing, who are on a mission to create sustainable, hard-wearing workwear that is stylish and versatile. I'm wearing it today. Their goal is to use their profits from their business to help the community they find themselves in, based in Scotland and in Glasgow. Finiston wants to be a brand that leads by example to be as sustainable as possible, to care for their staff and their community and give back to society and the broader planet. Profits from each garment from each collection, just like this, will go towards promoting and aiding mental, physical and environmental health in Scotland and beyond. They're completely transparent about the costs that are involved in making such garments, where those profits go and how they promote causes that they believe in. Finiston aims to be the antithesis of fast fashion. Their clothes are built to last, built for purpose and most importantly, built for the future. Every single time someone buys a Finiston product, money will go towards doing something good. Ross, who runs Finiston, is a great friend of mine, and he is a man on a mission to do the right thing for the right people. He is so heavily invested in my journey and invested in the journey of men. Head along to their shop, Finiston, that's in the west end of Glasgow and in Shawlands. Thanks for sponsoring this episode. George, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's a privilege. I've been following your content for a while and it's given me such a deep understanding about the boys and men around me in my life and the women that might or might not understand us. Mm. And I'd like to say publicly, I'm open about how I've lost an uncle and a cousin through um, symptoms of men's mental health Mm. and reading and consuming your content and hearing you on podcasts and having you today has given me a newfound understanding of them and how I can help those around me that are suffering, perhaps from some of the same indications and symptoms of what they've been through. So I just want to thank you off the bat for the work that you put into the world. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm sorry for your loss. That's awful. When people ask you, mate, what you do and what you speak about, how do you bring it to life? 
I, I, I do think male suicide is a great thin end of the wedge for my content because although I talk about a, like a wide gamut of issues, many of which are quite controversial, the common denominator for me is suicide. Everything I talk about, whether it's sort of poverty or homelessness or addiction or experiences of abuse or sexual violence against men, they all can and ultimately do lead to suicide often. Like when, when those issues are taken to 10 out of 10 on the volume, that's when suicide becomes a thing. So I find it's helpful because it, it, it sort of captures everything I'm trying to do, which is to reduce male suicide. And it positions it in a way that makes more palatable a lot of the things that people don't want to talk about. If, I, if you want to talk about male victims of domestic violence, for example, which is like right up the other end of the controversy scale, people don't want to have that discussion, especially if you're talking about violence by women. But if you talk about domestic violence by saying like, well, 11% of men who experience domestic violence will consider suicide, suddenly people are a bit more willing to understand it because it's actually a risk factor for suicide. My issue of suicide, especially male suicide, is that it's been politicised so much now. It's become like a pawn in some sort of horrible political game where so many catchphrases are used that just basically reduce the male experience to a single thing, like toxic masculinity or it's male privilege and totally ignores like how like brilliantly diverse and complicated suicide is, how idiosyncratic it is. I always start these conversations by saying I, I have no idea why a man would take his life. Like I will never know unless maybe I spoke to him himself, but that's not possible, of course. Uh, that, the thing that makes suicide so heartbreaking is that even the people closest to that man often have no idea. Like they have no idea. And I'm always like, well, if this wife or child or father had no idea why this person took their life, then what right does this person on Instagram or Twitter have to say, well, I know what it is and it's toxic masculinity. And not just that male suicide, not, not just that suicide, but all male suicides. And I'm, I just feel like, I don't know. So I, I can't give you any answers, but the issue of male suicide is far more, far broader than being seen as a mental health crisis. Of course, mental health plays a, a role in male suicide, but more like a moderating role. And the cause of male suicide are more often structural, external to that man and outside of his control. So this idea of men need to talk their problems away, although useful is not a complete solution. And you know, there's loads of things, like a lot of men in debt, uh, end their lives. A lot of men who are experiencing abuse, we've spoken about, end their life. A lot of men, one of the biggest is like losing children in family courts. And if you look at, think about a man who's lost his child or is losing his child unjustifiably, like the child is probably the most important thing in his life. So he's lost his relationship. He's probably losing his home as well. He's losing his child. Suddenly, suicide isn't really, he's not really got a mental health problem. He's got a, a family problem or relationship problem or a legal problem, child problem, financial problem. And like in a cold, horrible way, it's like, I understand why a man like that wouldn't want to be here anymore. He's lost everything. So pathologizing his experience as toxic to be spoken away or medicated away is like not, not right. And that, the solution to that man's problem is fair family courts, uh, financial support following a breakup, maybe uh, a new relationship, healthy relationship, a relationship with his kid. And it's not good enough to be like, well, talk about it. Like we don't do that in any of the agreements. We don't say, well, talk your problems away. And like such an idea would be absurd. But that's not to say talking doesn't help. It does help. It, it helps deal with the problem, but I don't think it solves the problem. I've heard you use an analogy of it's like taking the top of a, a boiling pot. Yeah. It yeah, relieves yeah. the pressure, but it isn't the solution to the boiling pot. It, it, it always makes me laugh because that's actually my friend Susie. Who's so got, Susie Bennett. Susie Bennett. <laughs> it just makes me laugh because I, can't, I actually can't do a podcast without mentioning her name. <laughs> and like quite rightly, her work is fantastic. Susie and I, she, Susie's got a PhD in male suicide quite recently. Her work has been published in some of the most respected psychological journals in the world, and she's only had a PhD for about a year. So her work is incredible. And it's all based, as you can tell, she's a woman, uh, but her work is based on men's experiences. So not based on some sort of political activism by someone on Twitter, but by sitting down with thousands, and, and I mean thousands of men, asking about their experiences uh, all over the world, thousands and thousands and thousands from about 70 or 80 different countries. And yeah, she talks a lot about that. So the pot, the lid, that's her, her analogy, which I'm happy to steal and develop. But she said that suicide is a, a lot like a pot of boiling water on a stove. And it's stove set to high, the lid's on the pot, the water's boiling up, and eventually the water's going to go over the, over the edge and it's going to create so much pressure that suicide in that instance is actually an, an, a viable outcome. And that man talking in that situation is the equivalent of taking the lid off the pot of water. So of course that will help. Of course the boiling's going to settle down, the heat might come down, the bubbling up will, will lessen. 
But the heat is still on. The flame is still the there. The flame is still on, and the lid does have to go back on top eventually. Like, you can't just... Therapy is great, but it only lasts an hour, and the lid goes back on, and the heat's still there. So what, what is that heat? Like I said, is that heat experiences abuse? Is that heat debt or joblessness? Is it relationship breakdown or losing your child? And how would you turn the heat off? Like, turn the heat off, take the lid off. Don't just take the lid off, because that's not solving the problem. And it's a lot more complicated than that. So, yeah. It is strange that we have labelled the boilerplate term of men's mental health as if it's like a men's only disease, like mm. prostate cancer, or testicular cancer. Mm. But it's much more complex than that. It's, uh, you can reduce it to the individual drivers of poor men's mental mm. health, which is debt, relationship breakdown, mm. custody battles. And I hear you speak about those things so emotively, mate. And yeah. I want to ask, why you? Why did you pick up the proverbial pen or the, uh, the typewriter or the keyboard and start writing about these <laughs> issues? Is it something that's pertinent in your own origin story or something that you felt a moral obligation or duty to fulfill? Um, I, don't, I don't have some sort of heartbreaking story, something, something I've been through. I mean, I've, I've had plenty of painful experiences, many around the issues I talk about, but I'm not some sort of traumatized artist looking for some sort of conclusion. Uh, I did it because I can, and I felt like I should. I mean, that's the simple, simple truth. I work professionally as a content creator, but in film, mostly film, but I also work in tone of voice. I also work in branding. I also work in animation, motion graphics, digital content online, websites. Like I'm addicted to communications and working out the best way of communicating things for my clients. So I worked with quite a big clients at the World Economic Forum, for example, I've worked with, and I actually worked with them on their gender gap report, which we can talk about now why it's flawed and why now in time I've seen how flawed it is. But I worked with people like WEF to help change people's minds. And then when the lockdown came along, they all went, they all went away because there was no filmmaking work over lockdown. So I was like, well, I've got this addiction <laughs> for creating content. I'll let, me, let me open up my laptop and I want to talk about this area of advocacy that I've always found interesting because it's interesting because no one wants to talk about it and that's men and boys advocacy. So I was like, what could someone with my skills and time, and my available time, do with my experiences in this area? And I'd do the research and I'd look at things like nine out of 10 homeless deaths are men or one in three victims of abuse is male or four and a half thousand men die every year at work. Uh, things about suicide, addiction, fatherlessness. Which I, I cannot believe, I cannot believe, for example, boys are behind in education at every level in every Western country and have been for my entire adult life, for my entire life, for more than 30 years. And I'm like, why is no one talking about that? And for me, it was, it was basically being dealt a hand of winning cards. I was like, that is a royal flush. Like, as a content creator, I've done much more with far less for the World Economic Forum and here are these cards that I genuinely can't believe they've actually been given to me. And I'm like, all I have to do is rearrange these facts and these words in the right, right way. And I reckon I'll unlock some sort of sea change of, sea change of like public awareness. And I guess I got a bit lost in my own confidence, my own abilities. But I'd present the ideas. I'd be like, hey, did you know that there are literally hundreds of papers that show domestic violence between women and men is equal. The perpetration rates are equal to men and women. And we can go into that. Hundreds of papers, hundreds and hundreds, not just one. Uh, and people didn't care. <laughs> I was just like, people didn't care that there are four million abused men in this country and they cannot go to refuges. They are systematically excluded from abuse shelters, like not and boys as well. A lot of young boys are thrown out of refuges. And I was like, that is that is criminal. And I was like, no one cares. Mm. So I stopped. I guess I stopped being shocked at the issues, although I remained shocked, and, and I was equally shocked if not more so shocked at people's complete apathy. And then once I was there, I'm quite stubborn. So I was like, let me just keep ratcheting up the style. Let me find another 200 studies. I ended up finding 1,700 studies by the PASC, which is the biggest database of domestic violence research in the world. Same conclusion. It's not men doing it to women, it's both. And it's both, it's women and it's men, and it's both doing it combined. And I was like, surely 1,700 papers is enough to change someone's mind. And I was like, and then didn't know. Yeah, you get a few thousand likes and some nice comments. But in my mind, I was like, this is going to be like that. When people find out this, these things, it's going to be like, <clears throat> and it, it just hasn't. And I'm like, what? That is intriguing for me as a content creator. Like, I feel like this winning hand I've been dealt, it's gone down. <laughs> it's gone yeah. down and I've lost another hand. So yeah, that's where it started. I mean, I found it... A, 
creatively very rewarding, personally very rewarding. A lot of the issues I speak about, I do have experience with, and I know people have experienced them too, uh, sadly. So yeah, it became important to me for many reasons. And your content is not a recalibration of where the pointed finger should fall. It's not that men's problems are because of women or mm. women's problems are because of women. You seem to try and bring women on the journey to understand why men are sometimes the way they are mm. and experiencing the things they are. And that men's problems are the problems of humans mm. and they're the downstream effect of either positive or mental a positive or bad mental mm. uh, health outcomes mm. for men are also affecting women. Mm. Uh, better health outcomes and mental health outcomes for men have a better ephemeral effect on women too. Mm. And we want everyone to be on this journey, mm. not just men. It's not either or uh, the positive implications of men and their outcomes isn't at the detriment of women either. Yeah, I mean... The issues that harm men harm everyone because often we we pay the price, a secondary price of what happens to them. I, I fundamentally just don't believe that anyone is born bad, neither men nor women. So when you see a violent man in the news who we hate, and I do not obviously support or condone what he's done, I am interested. I am interested in what shaped his behaviour for him to arrive at this point. Like what has he been through, good or bad, that has turned him into this violent man? And the same for women. Like I, women that are hostile towards me, I'm like, well. I understand you don't like men, but why is that? Like, what has happened to you at the hands of men that has made you hate them? And often there's a, a valid-ish reason to not necessarily justify, but to understand. Like, I want to understand behavior, not justify it. You can't like, mm. like these, these violent men we talk about, there's no justifying that violence, but we can work to understand it so as to stop other men following down, them down that path to doing the same thing. So I'll, I'll look at things like, men who have violent fantasies, men who fantasize about violence. And you'll look at the research and very interesting research from the University of Cambridge has found that a lot of the time it's bullying. A lot of boys who are horrifically bullied in school go on to have violent fantasies because they use violent fantasies as a way of dealing with more bullying. They're basically fantasizing about violence to come to prepare themselves for that violence. And suddenly if you look behind the violent man, you see the bullied boy. Not only do you see a way of stopping him becoming violent by reducing bullying, but you also have a bit of a renewed, dare I say it, compassion for that man. And you see him a bit like a victim in his own right. And that, that paper actually found that 97% of the most bullied boys in school went on to have violent fantasies. So more or less all of them. And it's interesting, and who, who pays the price of that violence? Often partners, often women. And that's why understanding these issues is a benefit to more people. Dome going back to domestic violence, half of domestic violence is bilateral meaning both partners are doing it. It's a cycle of violence into which both partners are feeding and escalates. So an argument becomes a shouting match and a shout becomes a shove and then someone gets slapped and the slap becomes a punch. And it's like an escalating cycle of violence. And like all, like all problems, all equations, you have to solve them on both sides. So in domestic violence, I want to solve both. I want to understand violent men. I want to understand violent women. But unfortunately, society only seems interested in understanding violent men. So I guess I'm trying to desperately fill in those gaps. And yeah, it's a benefit to women and girls. I am also apprehensive of presenting these issues as, as a benefit to women and girls, not because they're not, because they are, but it makes it seem like that's the primary benefit. And I don't do this for women and girls, I do this for men. And men deserve this in their own right. And it doesn't have to be presented as some sort of bonus. So I do I agree, I agree, but I'm apprehensive about leaning too much into the benefits to women and girls, because I feel like, it doesn't, it, it's, this is about men and helping men for men's sake. When you described your content and the gap in the market for your content, I don't want to use that term gap in the market as yeah. if it's some yeah, sort yeah. of capitalistic endeavor, but the gap in the market for your content, you described as a royal flush. Why don't you think <laughs> the statistics that you clearly demonstrate, why don't you think that sells to these organizations to morally improve? Why, why is the conversation around men's mental health somewhat taboo in certain spheres i just i don't know i don't know i mean i don't feel that way i feel like men are humans and <laughs> as a human as deserving as any human of support and understanding help his life is no less important than a woman's life in my opinion so i don't know why we will look the other way when thousands of men die at work every year in america or like hundreds of men die on the streets in the uk from homelessness i don't i literally don't understand how it's acceptable for a man being abused to go looking for help and then to be refused help because he's a man. 
and not just one, but millions of men. I don't, I don't understand. I can't even begin to justify that. But people clearly have a problem seeing men as victims. Like the image of men we are painted as perpetrator, perpetrator, oppressor, violent, misogynist, incel, like all these horrible terms. And why would you want to show compassion to a predator or someone that's dangerous? I, I just feel like we're living in a very cartoonish world of men where our, our barometer for masculinity or ma manliness or men in general is set by a very small number of highly problematic men who do horrific things that the vast majority of men would not do not accept and are horrified by and would probably intervene to stop. But we're all painted with that brush nonetheless. Like the things I see that men do on the uh, it's horrifying and most mm -hmm. men feel that way. But unfortunately that extremely visible minority of problematic men is somehow now the yardstick for, around which all men are measured. And, and like, we, we all become Wayne Cousins, for example. All men are Wayne Cousins, and who the hell has compassion for Wayne Cousins? No one. So that's the best I can do, mm. but it's not my belief. I don't understand why anyone would see that that way. I love speaking to all of the women in my life, like my best friends, my sister, and I ask her a lot about some of the topics that we're gonna talk about mm. today and have spoken about. And she made me aware of this phrase of, it's not all men, but it is all women. But I actually rebutted, but it's also all men that pay the consequences of those small groups mm. of men perpetrating violence or abuse or online bullying or being a troll or mm. other behaviors. All men pay the price of that minority mm. of action as well. Yeah. I mean, I, obviously I've come across that many times. I don't understand what, what that, how, what does that mean though? Like, Yes, most people that murder are men, but the vast majority of men are not murderers. Like we're talking like 99.9999% of men are not murderers. So like, why, why is this tiny, tiny percentage of men who the vast majority, practically all men would not agree with? What, how is that definitive of me and you and you? And like, like, it doesn't seem helpful. It doesn't seem like you're not gonna get men on side with that. A lot of people ask, like, why are men leaving the left? Why are men not feminists? It's probably because of language like that that sees us as like, horrible. Like there are a few things worse to be compared to than a murderer or a rapist. So how about we st stop that and understand that this, like the percentage of men that do these things are very small, but the problem is they're doing it to a lot of different women. So although the vast majority of women have experienced like sexual harassment, that's like 84%, I think it is. It doesn't mean 84% of men are doing it. It means a tiny percentage of assholes are doing it and ruining it for everyone. And like, we need to collectively stand together and point out those problematic minorities on, on, in all groups, not just men. And it's not about men versus women. It's about all of us versus the assholes. <laughs> the assholes has no gender. So um, I don't understand what the whole, no, it's not all men, but yes, it's all women means. It's like, you wouldn't say that to any other group again. It doesn't identify anything that causes violent crime doesn't make any effort to understand what shapes violent crime. Like, I mean, I've given you one example, bullying. It just says they're men, therefore they're guilty or suggests they're guilty. And uh, uh, what actionable advocacy even is that? Like, what does that even mean? Like, what, we're going to stop being men? Like, I can't stop being a man. I can't, dis I can't disappear. So let's talk about what shapes violence in a way that I've suggested and more as a, as a means of actually reducing it, understanding it and reducing it. Have you heard accounts of how this new label for men that's synonymous with violence and harassment and how there is a almost negative semantic about being a man, have you seen a good downstream effect on the lived experience of men because of that popular or somewhat popular yeah. narrative? Um, more so boys, I think. I think when I go on Twitter and I see these things, said, I'm, I'm smart, smart enough to know how stupid that is. I mean, I can be like that is just... It still it pisses me off, but it doesn't upset me. It doesn't, I don't absorb information, I don't think. I'm able to like not take offense because I, I can understand where it's coming from. But a lot of boys less so because they're developing their minds as sort of like sponges. And when they're surrounded by this, these ideas from such a young age, especially even in school, it's been fed to them in schools, like classic Australian example of the boys in at school were forced to apologize to girls in class, 12 year old boys standing up in assembly to, to offer some sort of uh, sim symbolic apology for nothing, for nothing, they haven't done anything wrong. I feel like that does more harm. And like, I think it's like 25% of boys in the UK, this is, 
have already been introduced at like age 12 or 13 to the idea that men are a problem in society, have already been exposed to ideas like toxic masculinity. And I'm like, what does that do to a boy's life? Forget about what it does to men, which is not by no means acceptable, but this landscape of negativity, this idea of that like male deficiency and just straight up anti-male bigotry, like what does that do to boys and girls? Like imagine telling girls that you're, you're going to live a life of oppression at the hands of men in your life, probably your male partner. You live in a patriarchy where you're going to be oppressed. You're going to be exposed to patriarchal violence. Like what, what life does that give her? Not a particularly nice one. And not one that's conducive to like actual progressive political change and like and togetherness. How do you hum- how do you communicate your message in a way that's not playing table tennis or tennis with the narrative of women and the worldview of women? And how do you move away from debunking myths and uh, instead of uh, 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 yeah yeah how do you, how do you move away from debunking myths? and bringing them on side to your message. How do you communicate what you communicate with that group of people that we ultimately need as men on our mm. side? How do you sugar the pill almost? Oh yeah, sugar the pill is an interesting way of putting it. I, the balancing act. I don't want to sugar the pill to the point where I'm treating women like children. Mm. Like I'm giving them a Haribo sweet. I'll treat women as adults and they're, they're able as adults to understand information like anyone else. And sometimes that information is stuff they might not want to hear, but I'll give it to their men away. Like I always think about it more like eating vegetables. Like no one wants to eat vegetables, but it's good for you. So like open wide, here comes some hard to swallow facts, unfortunately. It doesn't mean I'm going to present them in a needlessly provocative way or a way that like, is blaming women as a group. As a man, we've learned the lesson of what happens if you're blamed as a group. And we've just talked about that. But this, I don't want to also round off the edges too much in the way that we talk. Like, I don't apologize. I don't offer disclaimers or small print, sweeten the pill. Like, I don't want to... Like a lot of people will sort of get down on their knees and start praying. Like I'm, I'm about to talk about men and boys now. That doesn't mean I don't care about women and girls. And yes, women and girls also. But then this litany of sort of apologies, apologia. And like, I don't want to do that. So it's a balancing act. No, I don't want to be provocative. But neither do I want to sort of round things off and water down important points. Like one of the, an example of it, I'm doing a campaign at the minute to get a minister for men appointed in the UK. Involves like postcards and stuff in various different like areas of advocacy. One of the areas of advocacy is the fact that in the UK it's legally impossible for a woman to commit rape in the UK right now and rape against anyone, including men. That's how the legal system's set up. That's how the law's written in the UK right now. I don't think that's acceptable. I, get, I gave that to an MP and he like put it down. He's like, you can't say that. I was like, but it's true. And he's like, yeah, but you're going to upset some of the female MPs and female politicians and women's groups might get. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I, I'm not going to. Uh, place the hypothetical feelings of these female politicians above the needs of actual victims of of rape who are male. I'm like, that's just too bad. They just have to sit in that discomfort. Part of politics is being uncomfortable. Part of it's lying down on the bed of nails and dealing with it, sitting in a discomfort. So no, I don't want to be, I don't want to cause undue distress or hurt. But at the same time, I'm not going to, it's time to lie down on the bed of nails. Some people, sometimes you're wrong. Whose responsibility is it to improve outcomes for failing men? Is it a minister for your men and boys? Is it corporates? Is it individuals who are men or is it women or is it a collective of all? Everybody. I mean, anyone that's a member of society or anyone that cares about men is responsible uh, or at least obligated to do something. Like, it's not just men, although it is obviously men too. But I feel like we all as a society contribute to the conditioning of men and failing of men and not changing laws like the way I've mentioned and looking the other way as men are locked out of shelters and doing nothing as boys fall further and further behind. That's all of our fault, at least in terms of negligence. So yeah, I'd say it's all of us. It's not about women, it's not about men, it's not about feminists. And it's not about minister for men. The reason why I want a minister for men is so that person can then investigate these issues. The problem like boys in education, as I said, behind every stage, have been for decades and in every single country, in the West, the problem is we don't know. We don't, we don't know why that's happening. We don't know why it's happening because no one's asking the questions besides a bunch of, frankly, unqualified Instagrammers who are just trying their best to find out. I'm not qualified to have this conversation. Like, there needs to be a minister for men to, to, to look into these things in a way that I'm not capable of uh, so we can actually make those changes as a society. And like, the education gap's an interesting one because there's something going on we just do not understand because there are loads of groups in, in the UK and across the world that are behind other groups in education. Black students are behind white students. Poor students are behind rich students. 
state schools are behind private schools. And like, we don't like those gaps, but we can actually understand why that happens. We can understand why state schools, public schools are behind private schools. Not that it's justifying it, but we can see why. But the interesting thing about education is that boys and girls are coming from the same household, in the same area, from the same parents, same socioeconomic background, so of the same race, but boys are performing significantly worse than girls across the board. So it's like, why? we don't know why that's happening. And like the fact that we don't know why is the problem. And we need to work out why, not just in education, but in all these different areas. Like why are we, why is this, why, like how does victimhood and from, as a result of domestic violence present itself within men? What is driving male suicide? What is behind addiction, deaths of despair? Why do so many men die at work? Why do we give me, fathers equal rights to their children? Do, why are boys behind in school? These are the questions I'd love to ask for Minister of Men if one were to exist, which it doesn't. There has been a spotlight shone on men's mental health or men's problems recently. But one thing I love about your content is the investigation and showcase of boys' struggles. Mm, yeah. There doesn't seem to be as a popular narrative or um, as much focus put onto that, but no. boys become future men and mm. some of the symptoms might showcase themselves at an yeah. earlier age. So yeah. what are some of the pressures that young boys are facing? Well, thank you for correcting. I, I almost went back and corrected myself in my last answer when I said minister for men, because it is obviously a minister for men and boys. There's no, boys have significant problems. Education, probably the biggest one. Um, I mean, in America, it's a massive problem, but circumcision of boys is pretty horrific. It's not a problem in the UK as much, but it's still an, an issue. So I'd, if you're in America, I'd say that. And I'd just say... If you're a boy, you should know every single at every single age you're more likely to die than a girl, like significantly more so, especially in like teenage years, and like, that's for lots of different reasons. But at every age, men are more likely to die, and boys. It's like it's, it's like a continual set of privileges that like every single day you wake up, you're more likely to die. But boys, are more more broadly in a more abstract world, I just feel like the the negativity that surrounds men in the media is obviously harming boys. It's difficult to point to it as in like the education, you go, oh, look at these two graphs. This one's low, this one's high. But in terms of the culture around boys and masculinity and how it's so often vilified is, is a massive problem. There's also an emerging issue of things like sextortion, which we've talked about. I've talked about a lot, which is where young teenagers, mostly boys, so the primary victim is boys, are targeted on social media and coerced by a, a scam artist into sending sort of naked photos of themselves, like nudes, and the person then reveals himself, oh, I'm not, I'm not actually, this I'm actually a, a man normally actually doing it, and you need to pay me a thousand pounds, otherwise I'm gonna leak these to everyone you know. That's called sextortion. It's a massive problem. It's causing like suicides, quite a lot of suicides in America, young boys happening because of sextortion, and it happens that quick. Obviously that happens in other areas, like an old, an old person might get grifted by someone to shelling out 10,000 pounds for a patio that never arrives. And that takes months to like establish that relationship uh, over a course of time to build up rapport before you actually take the money. But sextortion doesn't take that, that long at all. It, takes, it can take one night. The stories of like a boy leaving his girlfriend's house 10 p.m. at night, he gets contacted by the scam artist at maybe 11, he'll send a photo at 12, uh, he finds out what's happening at one, the blackmail begins and he'll kill himself that same night. So in the space of just one single night, this whole thing's played out and he's actually now died. So sextortion is a big issue. And like anyone listening to this podcast, I would definitely encourage you to talk openly with your, all your children, but especially boys now, because boys don't get this conversation, but the risks of sending any photos online of yourself, especially sexual photos to strangers who you just met. Also, I mean, similar vein, but criminal exploitation of boys is a big problem. So young, young boys are now the number one victim of modern slavery in the UK. A lot of it's around gangs. So yeah, now we're yeah. You can't really talk about the problems of, men, of young, young men and boys without talking about gangs, especially in London, knife crime. But yeah, a lot of the county lines, uh, operations and gangs is now covered within a new definition of modern slavery. So young boys being exploited under threats of violence to basically carry drugs across the country over county lines. And it's really dangerous. Uh, and yeah, you're basically setting them up for a life of crime. And that's, that is modern slavery. And like I said, boys are the number one victim now of modern slavery as a result of criminal exploitation, which is now the number one form of slavery as well. So yeah, gangs, knife crime, modern slavery, sextortion, early death, uh, behind education, 
and, and suicide. Like suicide, the gap between boys and girls and suicide starts at about 12. So something happens at about 12, 13, 14, where it's, it's awful to think about any suicide of a young child, but the, the gap, boys do it significantly more than girls starting from 12 onwards. And then obviously the rest is history. You raised the necessity for parents having an intervention, especially around sextortion, but I can imagine mm. they have a, a great role to play across all of those domains. Specifically, a father's relationship with a boy. Are those things interdependent, or is there an intersection between how a male has an um, older male role model in their life? Mm. Is there an interdependency or yeah. relationship between all of that? that? I mean, all of the things I talk about, you know, boys behind, boys being excluded from school, homelessness, suicide, like all the horrible things that happen to boys and men that they seem to be made worse or at least associated with fatherlessness. Like gangs, for example, is a direct response, in my opinion, to fatherlessness. So many boys that pick up, a, pick up a knife and join a gang come from a fatherless home, often because they're looking for a sense of belonging elsewhere. They're looking for that male leadership elsewhere because there is no father at home. They'll find one in a gang instead. That sense of belonging and family and purpose, leadership. If not at home, they'll find it in a gang. And that's like a significant problem. And I feel like we've done a lot recently, well, I've done a lot for my entire life to, to diminish the importance of fathers. And the importance of fathers is huge, especially to boys' upbringing. And it just basically helps socialize boys. And it's not just um, at home where boys lack these male role models, but they just don't have them at school either. Like, Four and five teachers are female. So there's millions of boys that have no father at home. They'll go to school. No, no male role model, no male teacher. You know, they turn on the TV, they're confronted with a lot of these horrible archetypes of father and manliness. Go on TikTok and they'll see, they'll see the same. And boys are just surrounded by very poor role models from both the left and the right, in my opinion. And ultimately, they'll, they'll gravitate towards people that do speak positively about masculinity, like Andrew Tate, who is well, an alleged sex offender and an awful role model for anyone. But I can see why people listen to him because there's no one else speaking positively or kindly to boys. He's just a grifter who's, what, who's basically stepped into that vacuum and has now presented himself a bit like a gang. Oh, bring me your young men and boys. I'll talk to them. And he doesn't care. He just wants to exploit them more. But he is a response to our failure. So yeah, massive dearth of positive male role models in school, at home, on TV, media, everywhere. Like the fact that one of the facts that always shocks me in, in England, one in four state schools has no male teachers. None, not, not one male teacher in that entire school. So that's one in four. Not just, you know, like mostly women, but literally not one single man teaching in that school. So that's 24 percent of schools, yeah. Hearing the importance of community for mm. a young man strikes a chord with me. I I'm often asked about all the different pivotal moments in my life and I renounce them to post-rationalised events but only now I've realised how important. I grew up in a kind of uh, skate park and not on a skate park but I grew up, I spent a lot of my time oh. on a skate park. <laughs> Your um, whole childhood is you just <laughs> constantly trying to escape from this. Essentially, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I spent a lot of my time there and one thing that's beautiful about a skate park is that it's a sport whereby you intersect with older people, yeah. older men. Yeah. And you learn from their failings and shortcomings because they're open about it. Mm. And you learn about life through them. Mm. It's not like a football club whereby most of the other players are your same age. Mm. And then when I turned 15, 16, I joined a boxing gym, which is very much constructed yes. in a very similar way. And I recently had a guest on. He's a great friend, mentor, and my boxing coach, David Galbraith. And he runs a MMA gym in yep. Mary Hill in Glasgow, which is a really deprived area. Mm. And he goes into the community and looks for kids in mm. schools and, and mm. the wider society who are per perhaps showcasing vi violent traits or mm. recklessness. And he brings them into their to his gym mm. and creates a recourse or a, a new direction of some of those traits mm. in a more accepting environment, which is mm. maybe an outlet of boxing or MMA yeah. or grappling. Yeah. And says, we recognize you might have these aggressive tendencies. Mm. Let's reward that behavior in an environment that's conducive to it. Yeah. And he's become a role model for so many young men in that community, including myself now, I, mm. I go there. 
And I wish there was more men like him in local communities. And there was a directory whereby young boys and teens could find someone like that. A relatable role model. It's exactly why this podcast actually exists, is to use origin stories to develop relatable role models. I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I wish uh, more of those. At boxing, I hear so much good about boxing gyms and young, young men and boys. Often ones that would have joined gangs would go to a boxing gym instead. And it's just a great outlet for any frustration they have that otherwise would have come from some sort of violent crime. And it just treats men as men, boys as boys, and doesn't try to pretend, pre- present boys as some sort of dis- like ineffective wump girl or like some sort of broken girl. And if only he would act more like a girl, his problems would go away. Because unfortunately, boys are not girls and men are not women. And we're not def- I'm not a defective woman and the boy's not a defective girl. And it, a boxing gym, that, in the case you mentioned, is really great. It recognizes like, the power, either destructive or positive, of masculinity and how it can do great harm or great good. But a boxing gym allows a boy to channel that inner masculinity into something positive in a way that is not presenting it as a feminine thing. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, that's not the only story I've heard of boxing gyms. Honestly, these sort of things are so good. Boxing especially, but just any sort of men's group. Like, so many men's groups, so many peer-to-peer male support groups. So powerful. In the absence of political change, because there is no minister for men, we're, we're out on our own here. That like men's, for the time being, men and boys' lives will be saved by people like who you mentioned uh, and yourself and hopefully people like me. Giving spaces to men to be men in a positive way, in a way that they can do it together and share without being judged. And the sad thing is, a lot of men's groups are just vilified. Why? Just I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Are you, are you expecting me to think like some like crazy online maniac that I speak to frequently? But I don't. I, don't, I just don't understand. I don't. I, well, for the same reason that like, people see people see man as synonymous to bad, and they think of group of men as some sort of mini patriarchy that's just getting mm. together to, to decide how we're going to oppress women more, which is obviously stupid. And we shouldn't even entertain that idea. That's not what these groups are about. They're in the way you describe. I feel like these people actually think that should just go to a group before forming an opinion. Just go to one of these boxing groups and see how transformative it is for the boys going to them. And I just don't think you can have the same opinion. You'll see how positive they are. And it's frustrating. Like suicide is a massive problem. It's the biggest risk to my life today and tomorrow, and every day, and the same for you, and the same for you. That's, that's the biggest risk to your life. When the, one of the most important associated factors of suicide is loneliness and a feeling of isolation. Susie Bennett, who did the research, asked her, what are the most important areas of research in male suicide? 98% of clinical experts and lived experience experts came back and said loneliness, the number one. So loneliness is a great place to start to reducing male suicide. How do we reduce loneliness in men? By having men's groups, boxing groups, like hiking societies, but unfortunately, that very thing, which is the antidote to suicide, is also seen as some sort of inherent breeding, sort of inherently evil breeding ground for misogyny, which is not. So we're vilifying the very solution to male suicide. And it's not fair. Like, look at think about things like Boy Scouts, for example. Like, I think there's something very positive about boys having a space with other boys, with some sort of male leadership, just like girls. But Boy Scouts in America is no longer Boy Scouts. It's Scouting America, because girls can join. Boys obviously can't join Girl Scouts, but girls can join Boy Scouts. And although I have sympathy for the limitations of Girl Scouts, and it shouldn't all be like sewing and cooking, they should be doing all the same things as boys. But there's something powerful about men's groups, just men and boys groups, same for women and girls. And I don't think we should mess around with that. I don't think we should vilify that. Uh, Yeah, some sort of safeguarding like any group, but the idea that they're inherently problematic is not fair. And it does so much harm to vilifying the solution to loneliness, which is, of course, a massive problem with suicide. What could a young man or a young boy get from a men's only group that they couldn't get from a mixed group, do you think? So I think there's a sense of like safety and belonging between men. When, like, when I've been in these groups with men, it's so thoughtful and sensitive and sophisticated and vulnerable. I wonder whether bringing a woman in would change that dynamic where men might want to try and impress her. They wouldn't want to be vulnerable. They might feel judged even if they're not being judged. And I don't, I don't know, just something seems to change. Where like if, if, there's, if my girlfriend's having her girlfriend's around and they're all drinking wine, watching TV in the living room, if I were to be like, hey guys, the, the environment will obviously change. For no fault of my own, but there's something powerful about men's groups. There are obviously things that are just um, tangibly powerful 
like men more often need a bit more role modeling when it comes to opening up. Like in, in a therapeutic situation, I think a man would struggle more to sit down in a clinical environment with a therapist, sit like this, like face to face. Often a woman, because most therapists are women, and I don't think that's really set up for his sharing. Men prefer group environments with other men where maybe for the first week or so, a man doesn't say anything. He just listens to other men, learns, feels a bit more confident, builds that confidence and then eventually shares his own story. Like men want to see other men doing it first. Men want to feel part of a, a group. Uh, and often a group that isn't face-to-face, -face, so not face-to-face -face time. Like we're having shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time where you might be yeah, on a hike, you might be doing kickboxing, you might be playing golf, you might be uh, driving a car. Like It's amazing how much a man will open up more whilst driving than sitting like this, where it's very difficult for me to be vulnerable with you like this. But if we were to sit like this in a car... We're not looking at each other, we're distracted, we're doing something else, we've got a sense of journey and progress. I think I'd be a lot more comfortable, and I think most men would be. So shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time ahead of face-to-face -face time is a great way. And you, where do you get shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time? From men's groups. And I feel like that, that group is impacted by women. I mean, there's another... It, women are just better at communicating in general than men, especially with emotions. They have a greater set of like, words, they're more aware of themselves in general. And I think a space where men and women were opening up, being vulnerable, I feel like women would take up more room in that space because they more easily do it. It's a bit like if a, <laughs> if a woman joined your kickboxing group, she's not going to get like, mauled because she's not set up like a man where his physical advantage is the same as her emotional, linguistic advantage where in, in like a men's group, that woman would be advantaged because she so more easily can get in touch with her feelings and perhaps would speak a disproportionately large amount of the time where men would feel you know sidelined or disadvantaged so yeah i'd say that we spoke about the adverse effects of loneliness on men mm. and the prescription to that is community but i believe you can forge community by being emotionally literate mm. and we see that women are way more emotionally yeah. literate how do we teach young men to be more emotionally literate if community is the antidote to loneliness, which is a huge deciding factor of men's outcomes? I don't know if it's meant down to men. I, mean, I feel like you've, you've pointed a finger in the wrong direction there, where yeah. Yeah, like, emotional literacy, like any language, has to be taught. Mm. Like if I were to say, just start speaking French for me, go on, go away for five minutes and come back and speak some French, you couldn't do that unless you went outside and spoke to some sort of French teacher who taught you how to speak French. <laughs> So asking men to talk and then expecting to do it, to learn basically a new language without any sort of guidance or support or teaching is wrong. Uh, so I would say it's down for men to be receptive to learn, of course, but they, they, were, they were not taught. Men have been like, neglected in that way. They've not been exposed to the same sort of richness of emotions as girls have in childhood. And that's not their fault. That's society's fault. Parents' faults, teachers' faults, friends' faults sports coaches faults like to put a word to it it's called alexithemia which basically means without words for emotions mm. it's a beautiful word basically describes exactly what you're talking about it's the inability to put words to emotions inability to describe how you're feeling alexithemia male normative alexithemia describes what you're talking about where men generally have a harder time expressing themselves emotionally which is true but it doesn't it wasn't always like that a lot of evidence says boys actually have lower levels of alexithemia and are more in touch with their emotions in childhood, are more able to express themselves than girls, but something changes. And Levant, who coined alexithemia, the psychologist, he said it's down to how boys are trained by parents, teachers, sports coaches, mothers, fathers, friends. Like they're, they weren't born like that in the same way we described earlier. They, weren't, they didn't come out of the womb un unable to speak about their emotions. They're just not allowed to speak about the emotions. And now suddenly it's like, Tell me, <laughs> start speaking now. Like you, that man has a whole lifetime of emotional and social conditioning to unpack. And that takes time and it requires patience. And asking him to talk is, I feel like you're looking in the wrong direction a little bit. How has both social media and online resources contributed to the current state of men's outcomes, especially in light of alexithemia, do you think? There are role models, for, you referenced one of them, Andrew Tate, who might create a discourse for men improving that skill. For example, I think he said in a famous interview that he doesn't recognise the word depression and because oh. he doesn't recognise it exists, <laughs> he doesn't have the symptoms. I'm, I'm a standard trait 
train big time. I was on a social media break and I came back and I was like, what do you want me to talk about? And Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And that was the first thing I came across when he said that. There's no such thing as depression. I don't get depressed because I don't believe in depression in the same way. I don't believe in ghosts, so I'm not scared of ghosts. And I'm, it just blew my mind how naive that is. Uh, Andrew Tate is obviously no sort of role model for encouraging men to be emotional and express themselves or be vulnerable. That's, compl- and that's the antithesis of Andrew Tate. And like, he's very much against it. Like, I think, like, I've seen him really struggle to admit to times when he's cried. And <laughs> it's so awkward. Like, oh, yes, one single tear rolled down my cheek. And that was it. And he, I think he's very fragile and very insecure. I don't know, what, I don't know why, how he's become some sort of role model. But no, I don't think social media is particularly encouraging of men to talk. Or it is. But the person asking men to talk is never willing to listen to what they've got to say. Like... So many charities, especially male suicide, asking men to talk and then never speaking about themselves, what they've heard from these men. So a man sits down at one of his charities and said, I'm being abused by my wife. I, I don't want to be here anymore. I, I've got, no one's helped me. There's no funding. There's no shelter. No one believes me. People think I'm a perpetrator. I don't want to, I, I honestly feel like I'm being pushed towards suicide. And if that charity listening to that doesn't then go on to advocate for male victims of abuse to help solve the very problems he's talking about, I'm like, what are you even doing? I don't ask men to talk unless you're actually going to listen to what they've got to say to you. And listening is difficult. Like I said, lying down on the bed of nails and understanding that the male experience isn't what you thought it was and it's actually far more traumatic and deeper, more complicated than that. So social media may well be encouraging men to talk, but it's absolutely not ready to listen to what men are telling them. And I feel like men are already telling them. Like Another fact I've, I found interesting was a study of men who had completed suicide in the UK middle-aged men, found that 91% of them had sought help, had actually been to frontline services or mental health services, sought help, and yet they still died by suicide. So that's more than 9 in 10 men who died by suicide had sought help, had talked in a way, we encouraged them to, but they still died. So I, why, maybe we should start asking, we need to listen better, listen to men, and then ideally act upon what they're telling us, rather than just telling them to talk all the time. Wow. And the worst thing as well, those, those same men who did talk, uh, of those men who died by suicide and who were seen by a clinician, 80% of those men were, were categorized as low risk or no risk to suicide, but then killed themselves. It's 80%. Imagine saying 80% of people coming to me for a problem are at low risk or no risk, and then they, almost all of them go on to do the actual thing. I said, uh, so clearly we're not seeing male distress, so we're not responding in a way that's actually effective. And that constantly men to talk is all about gaslighting them. Mm. And there's another half of talking and then that half's listening. What is the unit of measurement or what's the measurement device to understand whether a man is low or no risk? Is that what's flawed? Oh, I, I mean, whatever they are, I'm sure they're probably based on how women express, dis, show distress. Like, a, like, a, like psychology in general is dominated by women. 85% of clinical psychologists are women. They will see things as a woman does often in the same way that I'll see a man as the world through the eyes of a man. And the problem with psychology is that I don't know if we recognize the unique ways in which men show distress or we miscategorize them. Like um, Susie's spoken about this a lot, but men talking about suicide is often done in like very matter of fact ways, almost like a joke. Like men often joke about it or sound like they're joking about it. And they're saying it in a very plain way. Uh, and that is an actual disclosure of suicide. But we don't see it that way. We see it as a joke. It's not being serious. Or it's not real. Or don't worry about it. But that's how men often disclose in a very matter-of-fact, pragmatic way. Like, I feel like I want to kill myself. That isn't how women often do it. Very different. And it's important to recognise that men don't express themselves like women all the time. Some do, some don't. Mostly they don't. That doesn't make it any less important. doesn't make it any less, like, of a priority. And we just need to understand how we, we're not, I don't think we're reading male distress correctly. And like, that's a language that we, we don't understand, I don't think. Do you do much research into the, the problems facing women at the moment? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was a feminist for my entire adult life until about five years ago. Like, I, I've spent a week, more, I've been, I spent eight nights sleeping on the streets of London, raising money for women who have been abused by their partners. I tried, I tried to open up a bakery to employ women that were trafficked and abused to give them an honest day's work 
to get them off the streets, to get them out of the house, to get them away from like the pimps, to give them like a, a job at a bakery. And I tried to set up a bakery and I tried to raise money by being homeless for a week and it was really successful. So I feel like I have proven myself <laughs> as a feminist and a, and a lover of women's rights and um, the biggest role models in my life have all been women, mostly my mum. So yeah, I don't, I don't understand these issues like a woman would. So when I go to the women's march, I don't, I'm not at the front waving a fucking giant sign. I'm at the back making up the numbers. So yeah, I, 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 can't, I can only claim to understand them as much as any man can, but I'm certainly very interested to learn more. But un unfortunately, just because I don't talk about women's issues on my page, doesn't mean I don't care about them. Doesn't mean I don't care as much as I do about men. And the only reason I talk exclusively about men is because no one else will. And I'm trying to sort of fill out that gap a little bit. So absolutely care about women and girls. I'm, you know, I'm pro-choice, I consider myself left wing. I think I'm a progressive. I'm horrified by what's happening to women's rights in America and the reproductive, like women's reproductive rights. And yeah, on my personal page, you'll see me speaking about that. And like, it doesn't matter to me, but it's just not what the Tin Men's about. If we're using this podcast to raise awareness to both men and women of the failings of support for men at the moment, mm. is there anything that we can talk about in terms of raising awareness of where women are struggling at the moment? Uh, I just don't know if it's my... I would struggle to do that because I feel like it'd be disingenuous. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I speak... My, my content's highly personal because I understand, although I may not have first-hand experience of everything, I do understand. It does resonate with me. I feel like an urge to create the content of necessity, almost like I'm possessed. There's no wheel. If you look at it, like, it's a massive waste of my time and money. I don't get anything from it. It pays a huge emotional toll on me and time and money and to my relationships and like my, I've lost friends over it. Uh, I do it because I feel like I have to and I feel like I'm a little bit possessed, obligated by it. But I don't feel that way with women's issues. I feel like there are better people to do it. And if I were to do it, I'd feel like I'd be doing it for disingenuous reasons, mm -hmm. reasons to sort of grow my pay. It would feel like I would be exploiting women's issues to grow my profile where absolutely support women's issues and want to learn more but I, I, I want to sit down and listen like I want to see I want, I want a woman to tell me what women's issues and I want to listen and I want to learn and I want to go back to my normal life and try and make changes and I wish when it came to things like male suicide like women a lot of women have become sent in the conversation and I wish they would just sit down as well there's a seat for you as well to listen to men like men should be listening to women women should listen to men it's not my job to speak for women and I, d I wouldn't know how to even if I even if I could, George, I have great respect for that. Like really great respect for Good. that. Good, thank you. And I make an ode on this podcast to have a woman on in the yeah. next month to talk about the problems that she mm. may be facing too. Um, so mm. I learn from her perspective. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm a listener. I got two ears and one mouth. <laughs> I use my mouth a lot more than my ears sometimes. But I mean, all the women in my life tell me horrible stories about what they've experienced. There's that like, women that text me that like, started off as followers. They're just telling me about how much harassment they face. And I'm like, can you just text me? One, well, I'm sure she went mine, but Andy was a, a follower of mine, one of my earliest followers. She, you know, she's an attractive woman. And she'd always get catcalled. And I'm like, I, this never happens when I'm around because women aren't catcalled when they're with men because the man will probably get his head kicked in. But it happens when on their own but by cowards who uh, realize they're, they're not going to face any, probably not going to face any response because she's terrified. So it never happens. I never see it. I've never, I think I've only seen it like twice in my entire life. And I was like, can you just please text me every time it happens? Just so I get an understanding of how often it happens. So I don't understand. People tell me it happens every day, but I never see it. So I, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but it doesn't seem like it happens every day. And she would fucking text me every day. Like, it happened here, it happened at the bus stop, it happened here. And I'm like, <laughs> like, what? Like, that's crazy. So that wouldn't have happened had I not listened to her and asked her to share with me her experiences. And it totally transformed my point of view. Like, because men and women don't live the same lives, I think they find it very difficult to understand what the male and female experience is like. Like, the male experience is very much opposite to women's experiences, whereas women have that spotlight of expectations sort of beaming down onto them all the time. Men often walk through society as a ghost. Men get no positive attention, certainly no catcalls, and, like, we're, we're neglected, we don't get any... I think most men would go months without any kind words or compliments paid to them, Whereas women, like Andy, have compliments sh shouted at them from a car window. So 
it's very difficult for a man to understand that and for a woman to understand what it feels like to be invisible, to be a ghost, to be completely ignored and to not have anyone smile in the street, not to have anyone even look at you, not, certainly not have anyone say anything nice about you. Very difficult. I've, I've compared it to like, it's a bit like someone drowning in the ocean, talking to someone that's like dying of thirst in the desert. Like one of them is gasping for a glass of water and the other one's drowning in it. And I was like, obviously those people, two people will never understand the opposite experience because it's just so unfamiliar. So that's, I guess the point of that is like, that's why listening is important, especially listening to those who don't have your lived experience. And that goes both ways. Like I, as much as women should listen to men, as men should listen to women, I feel like, I feel like I'm a testament to how much a lot of women have learned from my page. Like a quarter of my followers are women. So we're talking like more than 15,000 women follow me. And like, yeah, I get some hostility from some women, but for every hostile message, I'll, I promise you I'll get a hundred messages of support from other women, more grown up women, who are genuinely grateful, especially mums, grateful for helping them understand that like, I just no idea this is happening, no idea. And there's so many things I've learned about women that I had no idea about. So yeah, let's talk more listening. That's exactly why I wanted to record with you, Good. George. <laughs> yeah. uh, That's honestly an authentic, I'm not saying that to be all virtuous, but I genuinely feel like I'm blessed. I've learned, like I said, greatest role models in my life have been women. Like, if I hadn't listened to what they had to tell me, I'd be worse off. So purely from a selfish point of view, it's a benefit. What's next for you and the Tenement? Uh, ego aside, I, I have a large set of creative skills. Like I, I, I can write, I can design, I can animate. I am a professional filmmaker by trade. I can more or less create whatever you want. The problem is there's no money in there. Like I create high-end documentaries. I also have gotten a, hand of, a handle of these really important issues and have about five years experience talking about them. It's not hard to put those two together, like documentary, understanding of men and boys' advocacy. The only thing that's missing is money. And uh, filmmaking is very difficult. I, I work with a lot of high-end podcasts, so I won't name, but I feel like I can, I feel like the work I do and the people I work with can do is very impressive. And I hope they're proving it a little bit through my page, which I just create on a laptop. I just wish, I just want to do more. I want to do more filmmaking. I want to interview more men. Uh, and I want to obviously keep on creating the content I am doing. And also, I think I'm, what I'm probably most proud of with the Tin Men is not my content at all. It's the secondary reverberations outwards that come from it. Like every week I'm contacted by amazing people that want to set up a men's group, want to write a presentation on something, want me to look at a thesis they've written, uh, want to make a, 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 something within their students' union, uh, I had a police officer contact me who's setting up a men's network for the entire north of England and he wants my help. And these are the things I'm really proud of because they, they're real life impact that I know will have exponentially greater impact than I can possibly have. So more of that. And if anyone, I mean, I try to read all the DMs I get and if you come to me with a great idea and I believe you have a good heart and you've, you've proven yourself over time, I'll be like, what can I do to help? Like, what can I do? How can I make my platform your platform? How can I help grow your, your vision for men? I love hearing yeah. how that impact almost drags you, that second-hand impact, those DMs, yeah. those invites drag you through what is the ultimate form of doom scrolling at time. I said that to you yeah. offline, where you're an up first thing reading some horrifying mm. accounts of men and boys, and it seems like this impact that you have, yeah. the second-hand impact, third-hand impact, and first-hand impact drags you through those darkest of hours literally yeah. darkest of hours and yeah yeah if anyone wants to support george reach out please send me a dm thank you um yeah it, it generally does like i get a lot of it i mean i already get a lot of it i get so much appreciation and thanks and it's an honor and a privilege uh and it does keep me going because i do get not so nice things sent to me as well and it is difficult difficult for a lot of reasons difficult in terms of like just the time and money it takes uh, and the sacrifice I have to make personally to keep to keep creating content at the level I do consistently is difficult. It's also difficult because the topics I'm talking about are just heavy. Like I'll get up at like six thirty in the morning and start creating content. I'm not even going out of bed. I'm with my girlfriend. And I'm I'm reading stories of Boko Haram terrorist group burning boys in cages in Nigeria, <laughs> and I'm just like I've not even had breakfast or brushed my teeth yet, and I'm reading this, and it's honestly horrible. That. The impact of that is only exacerbated further by the fact that no one else is doing it. And if I try to talk about it to anyone, 
so many people will even roll their eyes and not care or say women have it worse. And I feel like there's a, there's a joke I've always thought, it's not a funny joke, but it's a joke that reminds me of how I feel. And the joke goes like this. It's, um, there was a crazy man driving the wrong way down the motorway. A uh, family watching the, the, <laughs> the event play out at home on the TV, breaking news. The mum's like, oh my God, granddad's coming down that road from work any minute now. Let's quickly call him. There's a crazy man driving the wrong way down the road. So they call granddad and granddad's like, one person driving the wrong way. Everyone's driving the wrong way. And I feel like I wonder if I'm that man. I'm driving this car. Everyone seems to be saying everything different to me. There are no pages presenting this information like I am. Everyone's saying the opposite. And it would make sense that I'm the one that's driving the wrong way down the road. And that makes it really hard. It feels like, why is no one, like, for example, why is it acceptable to allow boys to fall behind in the way they have, in the scale they have, for as long as they have? Like, how is that acceptable? I don't believe we would allow that to happen to any other group. I don't understand why that's acceptable. I'm literally like, like, why is that not the front page of every newspaper every single day until it's solved? Like, that's significant, massive problem. Same with domestic violence, how, how men are not supported or in sheltered, just left to, to, out in the cold. And that gaslighting makes it worse because like, um, the hard work, the time, the money, uh, the cost of my social friends, the emotional toll, and then there's the gaslighting on top of it. The gaslighting, you know, that, like, why is everyone not reading about what's happening to Nigerian boys but Boko Haram? Why is everyone not waking up and being like, holy shit, this is crazy? And I don't, I don't, I don't know. If this conversation has sparked an emotional chords with a listener regardless of who they are and they feel the necessity to do something with their own agency to contribute mm. to your message or the broader message of better outcomes or healthy outcomes for boys and men mm. what could they personally do within their own self-sovereignty i think you don't have to set up a charity or you know run a marathon i feel like the small acts of support to other people in your life including women but i'm talking about men currently just calling a, a guy like listen to, at the end of this podcast what is stopping you from picking up the phone just calling a, a male friend of yours for no reason whatsoever just a chat checking how he's doing just a five minute chat there's n literally nothing stopping you from doing that and i promise you he'll feel better and you'll feel better it's like a win-win and it's free and you can do it right now anyone can do that and if everyone does these single acts of kindness like everyone does that massive societal change like we are each of us the antidote to each other's pain in many ways. And like, there's nothing stopping us from doing that. I'm stealing it from Chris Williamson, so I give him the credit. But he said, there's a great thing where if you think about someone in your life, text them. So I've thought about him now, so I'm going to text him. So expect to text Chris. But that's great advice. Like if you think about, oh yeah, that time when I went and played golf with Will, you know, five years ago, I'm going to text him right. Text, text, and that's, that, that's it. it doesn't, you don't have to like, run a marathon or like serve for charity you can just do small things like that and like those grassroots changes are huge it's a bit like there's another saying there's another story i don't even know if it's real it might be an allegorical story but there's a professor at a university and all of his students sat down and his first lesson he said uh, all of you are here because you want to change the world and there's nothing wrong with that but i want you to know it's okay if you change the world for just one person and it's okay if that person is you and I feel like a lot of people are desperate to hear that. Like a lot of people feel like they have to save the world for everyone all the time. You just have to save yourself, maybe a few friends close to you. So yeah, in the absence of massive political change, we need to look to each other for that, for support. And that comes through just mundane acts of kindness. So yeah, give, a, give your mates a call and check in. And Text on, them. on that note, let's end the podcast so we can all do that ourselves. Yeah, all right, yeah. Go and do it right now. Thanks, George. No worries.